Uh, so, um, hope everybody had a good lunch, uh, and we'll have more in a minute. Uh, so I'm going to talk about an open source embedded controller, and this actually is the one we use on Chrome OS. So um, uh, I'm he heavily meme, meme intensive here. Um, I am Bill Richardson. I have been a part of Chrome OS almost since the very beginning, for about uh, six and a half, seven years now. Um, and the things that I generally have worked on or am working on, Verified Boot, which Randall talked about, you know, I kind of did all that together. Uh, developer mode, ensuring that as a Chromebook owner, you get the right and power to fiddle with it, um, get under the hood, get root, mess with it. Um, been doing a lot of work on the embedded controller, which is what this talk is about. Um, recently, I've been doing a little bit of case closed debugging stuff and some USB device endpoint things. Um, and that's all related to some stuff I can't talk about yet, but you know, we are all the time coming up with new things and eventually when they're public, uh, we try to make it public as soon as we can. Um, uh, okay, so um, what's an embedded controller anyway? Some of you know probably as much or more about it than I do. Others may not have heard of it. Um, every laptop has in it, or almost every laptop has in it, uh, a tiny little processor in addition to the main CPU um, that runs even when the main CPU is off. So when you shut your laptop off and you come along and plug the battery cable in, a little light comes on to tell you the battery's charging. Um, that is not an automatic process. There is a microcontroller in there that handles that. It does things like ensure that the charging happens at the right voltages, make sure that it stops when the battery is full, um, things like that. So, so most laptops have an embedded controller of this sort. Um, Chromebooks do too. Um, and ours is open source, uh, which is unusual among laptop-like devices. Uh, so that's primarily what we're, we're talking about here. Um, if I use the word AP, I mean the application processor, the main system CPU, um, because when we were talking about the firmware and the source code, it became very confusing to us when we talked about the processor. And they're like, wait, which processor? The embedded controller processor or the CPU main processor? And so we, we just use the term AP. EC for those terms. Um, okay, what does this have to do with core boot? Uh, well, really not a whole lot, um, but it is used in most Chromebooks and a lot of uh, core boot developers uh, use Chromebooks or like them because that's what runs in Chromebooks. So it's a good place to hack on core boot. Um, and Stefan thought that uh, y'all might find it interesting. And so here I am, surprise. Um, so he said, come and talk about it. I'm talking about it, uh, okay. So if we look back at Chrome OS and how it came to be, uh, the first three Chromebooks that we released, the CR48 and uh, what we call ZGB and uh, Alex, um, had a UEFI-based BIOS. And we put a lot of work into it. We got really good help from our independent BIOS vendor, which was Inside Software. Um, and they added a lot of nice features for us, and they cut out a lot of features. So they made it boot quickly, made it resume quickly, took out some stuff we didn't need. Um, and that worked, but it had some drawbacks. Um, the source code is large, it is slow, it is extraordinarily complicated, it is expensive in the sense that it is not free, we have to license it. Um, it's closed source, so we could see it, but y'all couldn't. Tiano Core is the, the part that is public, and that's only about half of what you need to actually implement things. It doesn't have USB support, doesn't have a lot of the board specific pieces. Um, and it only builds on Windows, which is also a problem for us. Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, Randall made a little um, VMware instance of a Windows machine from his home, and then we you know launched that, built the firmware, and then pulled it back out again. Um, and so after those first three Chromebooks, uh, we switched to Core Boot. Um, and that was a, you know, generally regarded as a good thing. Yay. Um, and it solved most of those problems. Uh, but the EC, the embedded controller, that again is part of all the Chromebooks, or most of the Chromebooks, uh, was still provided by the ODM. Um, if you're not familiar with ODM, if you ever go to Best Buy or somewhere and you're looking at laptops that you want to buy, you'll notice that even though different vendors make them, be it Lenovo or uh, HP, Dell, Acer, whoever, they're all kind of the same. They have kind of the same thing. The, the ports are all on one side, the power cords on another side, and there are some differences, but any particular CPU, they're kind of the same with just a different branding. And the reason is the original design manufacturer is a usually Chinese company who puts together a motherboard 
using a particular CPU from Intel or someone. And then different OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, come along, make a couple tweaks, and then slap their sticker on it. Um, and that's why they all look the same, is they actually are all the same underneath. Um, and so the ODM typically, as part of that, has provided the embedded controller as well as the source code that runs on it. Um, and we found out with those early Chromebooks that this had some problems as well. Um, it's slow. Uh, it's buggy. We can't see the source. Um, there's a long turnaround time for every change. Whenever we find a bug, we would write up the bug report. We'd email it to somebody in China. They would ask a couple of questions because there was usually some sort of language barrier. And then eventually they would come up a week or two later and say, here, try this. And we'd get a blob and we'd put it on there. And that might solve one problem, but it usually introduced another one. Um, and an example of the sort of problems we had is we, for the first time ever, had a BIOS that would boot from cold power off to running the kernel in just a few seconds, you know, seven or eight seconds, something like that, um, to fully up. And what we found was it would start to come up and then there would be a second pause, a long one second pause when nothing was happening. And we're like, what's it doing? And we ask and it's like, okay, the EC is not asserting the right voltage control rails. Why not? And so we would ask, and they're like, oh, yeah, Windows 95 had this problem that you had to wait for a second. We're like, we're not running Windows 95. Take it out. And so they're like, okay. So they'd take that delay out, and that would be, introduce another race condition. And now something else didn't work, or it would boot, but none of the Wi-Fi worked. Um, so we thought, well, maybe we could just make our own, and then we'd solve some of these problems. Um, so the main thing that an EC does in a, in a laptop device is the primary thing is the AP power sequencing. Um, it used to be way back when, if you bought a CPU to turn it on, you just connected five volts to a pin and it came on. That is no longer true. It hasn't been true for years. What actually happens is if you look at an Intel chip or an ARM chip, any, any you know, modern processor, um, they might have five or six or 12 different voltage supply points. Some three volts, some five volts, some you know, 1.2 volts, 1.8 volts, 3.0, 3.3. And those all have to be turned on in a particular sequence with a certain amount of timing between them. And at every step you wait for a signal that comes back that says, okay, I've seen this voltage, it is stable, it's time to do the next one. Um, and all that has to be sequenced properly at the right times, and as well, not just turning on, but turning off too. So when it's time to shut the thing down, you disassert dis one signal, that waits for another signal, that does another one, and depending on which signals and in what order, that makes the CPU go into sleep or suspend or some sort of deep sleep. And Intel, I think, has like, you know, 17 different power states now that it supports. Uh, or more, Duncan and Aaron can tell you, and, and it's a complex mess. And so the, the EC has to manage that. And then, as I mentioned, it has to handle the battery charging. Uh, thermal management uh, runs the fans, measures temperature, reports that to the AP, which can then decide to assert that, oh, I'm too hot, I should throttle myself. Or maybe the EC sends a signal that says, hey, it's too hot, you should throttle yourself. Um, there's a keyboard scan matrix so that when I've got uh, a laptop, um, I don't have one button for every key. I've got a grid of keys that are constantly sampled. And so when I push one, there might be a vertical row or a horizontal row. And then suddenly there's a bunch of scans across to see which of those buttons I've held down. Um, but there's a, a usually a, a device that handles that. Uh, typically the embedded controller could be something else. And all the other buttons, switches, lights, LEDs, all that kind of stuff. So that's what the EC does. Um, and as I mentioned, the power sequencing is the main part of that that has to be done just right. Um, but in addition to all those sleep, idle, resume states, then you also have to apply power or remove power from various other peripherals for USB, Wi-Fi, things like that. So if the system goes to sleep, you need to turn the Wi-Fi off, or maybe you need to turn the USB off, or maybe you need to monitor it so it can wake you back up. Um, but still, um, you know, how hard can it be? We've kind of described all the problems, and, and this is, you know, I mean, somebody's done it. We can do it, too. I mean, the, the BIOS is hard. Uh, it couldn't be, shouldn't be that bad. So really, thinking about it, uh, and this was, what, time frame, 2011, something like that? We're thinking, okay, all we need is kind of a mid-range system on a chip uh, with some, some various GPIOs and peripherals. It's got to have a lot of GPIOs um, because of things, and it's got to have a fairly large number of peripherals, which means there's not a ton of choices, um, but there are a few out there. Um, and we need some kind of SDK or, or software environment that we can write software for it. Um, 
So we looked around, and Texas Instruments had a pretty nice chip. Uh, the Stellaris LM4, which they've renamed to, I think, Tiva, TM4. Um, and it should do great, and that's the one we chose to start with. It has an ARM, um, cort uh, ARM Cortex core, has uh, integrated flash and RAM, uh, lots of GPIOs, which we need for the keyboard scan matrix. Um, it has A to D converters uh, for power and monitoring, things like that. It had some PWM controllers that you could just set and forget to handle fans and backlights and things like that. A lot of timers, counters, all the stuff. And their engineers were actually very helpful. They were, they were easy to work with. They were great guys. They said, here, we'll help you with this, and oh, what do you need, and so forth. Um, and for software, they even had an SDK that we could license. And that word, license. Hmm. So at that point, um, you know, you don't just license things. You actually ask for permission. And so uh, we had to ask the lawyers. Well, that's fine. That's a normal business process. Um, and we did. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and about, what, six weeks maybe, something later. Six weeks later, they finally came back to us and said, yeah, that thing that you wanted, you can look at the code. You can't use it. You can just look at it. So we looked at it, and I forget the details, but I think it was something like it was written in Java, or you wrote your code in Java, and then it translated it to C, and then compiled that and put that on the embedded controller. Um, and obviously it would not suit us. This is not what we wanted. We want something that we could actually debug when it didn't work. Um, so we said, all right, let's think of something else. We've wasted six weeks of our time doing nothing, waiting for the lawyers to sign up on this. So Randall and Vincent, who's not here, but it's one of our firmware kernel guys, um, they got together over the weekend and they wrote us a little OS. I think they said, you know, we did this in college. It's not that hard. It's ARM core. We can just do it. And so they came up with a simple, Chrome OS EC firmware. Um, it has a small number of tasks that are um, each with their own stack. They can be interrupt driven, so you can switch between them. Um, the priorities are strictly ordered, so you have to decide up front which is the most important task in the next and so forth. Um, got various event signals, mutex, timers, callbacks, all the normal stuff that you have in a, a, uh, you know, a multi-threaded operating system. There's no heap, uh, which means there's no memory leaks, or at least few memory leaks. Um, it's fairly modular, modular and configurable. And it's written in C, and it's open source. So it's there on, on chromium.org. Um, and it doesn't have a clever name. Uh, we never got around to coming up with one, so it's not like foo or bar. It's, it's just you know the EC firmware. So people say, well, what's the name of your OS? And, well, it's just, it is what it is. Um, OK. So. I already gave a talk on this. Um, we had, in fact, that link shows where it is. Of course, I'm sure we'll share all these slides around. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, we work with partners on all these Chromebooks, and we try to get them to contribute because it's all open source. Um, and so I gave a talk on this at our firmware summit, which describes pretty much everything we do in terms of firmware for Chrome OS and how to work on it. So I'm not going to really go into that again. I'm just telling you that you know it exists. Um, and since then, a couple of years, we've made some more improvements. We've cleaned up the code. We've refactored it. We now support, what is that, six different chip vendors, um, three different cores, one of which is not even ARM. Um, we've got a whole bunch more Chromebooks. And the EC hardware, GPOs, connections, what it does, how it does it, all that has to be adjusted and tailored very carefully for each individual motherboard as well as you know chip. And in addition, because, you know, we have a tool and or we have some software and we have a need and guess what, we'll just put them together. Um, we've expanded the use cases, the things that we do with the EC firmware. Uh, we've changed a lot. We've added a lot to it. It does all the original EC functions on Chromebooks. Um, with the USB Type-C stuff, um, which the Pixel uses now and a few other parts, uh, that's not just a dumb connection anymore. It actually does some negotiation back and forth. It says you plug in a power brick and it says, uh, okay, I see that you are connected. What are you? And it says, well, I can deliver power or I can uh, accept power. And it's like, well, I would like some power. How much would you like? I would like this much. And so there's this sort of handshake back and forth that goes on. So that has to be there. Um, so we've used this in a, in a little controller for that purpose, as well as the other end, the power brick itself. Um, has a similar thing that does the same negotiation the other way. So we use our EC firmware in the uh, Pixel Power Brick. Um, we used it to do some case closed debug. Uh, the uh, Pixel C, which is actually a, an Android product, um, but looks a lot like this guy, except the keyboard comes apart. 
Um, it has a couple of SOCs in it that are running REC firmware for various things, um, such as case closed debug. You can just plug in a, an adapter to the outside and it will expose over USB various internal signals and, and consoles, things like that. Um, plus, there are a bunch of other sensors and peripherals. We now scan things like uh, we detect lid angle on some of the devices uh, by using little accelerometers, and we detect knock. If you, you double tap this guy, it'll tell you the, the, the power levels. If I knock it right there, well, it will. Maybe it's got to be closed. Um, anyway, so things like that that it can detect what's going on. So we're using a lot of other functions that we hadn't thought of originally. Um, which is great until we realize that, hey, we're using it in a lot of other areas that we hadn't thought of originally. Um, so how do we make it secure? Um, Randall talked about this earlier, and remember, too, that security can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, we don't claim that it is perfect. We just claim that it is good enough for us today, and we have the ability to upgrade it, and we would certainly welcome improvements. One of the things that we can do is what we call the EC Software Sync, and the idea is that on a system like the Pixel or any other Chromebook where the embedded controller is soldered to the motherboard, um, all we really need to know is that the AP BIOS and the EC firmware are running corresponding revisions, right? So if we make a new BIOS change that says, hi, I need to be notified when the fan temperature or when the fans get stuck or the temperature goes too high, we need to ensure that the embedded controller can do that. Um, and the way that works is when you first power on the system, um, the AP, as, as Randall mentioned in his verified boot talk, stays in read-only firmware. The EC, the embedded controller, also has a read-only firmware, and they both come up. So now we're in read-only, read-only. Um, the EC hangs around and waits. It sits there. The application processor continues to boot, verifies its read-write firmware. It has a copy of what it thinks the EC ought to have, and the EC while it's waiting for the AP to boot, and of course the EC is part of that process in terms of enabling power, so the EC calculates a hash of what it has in its read-write area. And then the AP comes along and says, okay, I've booted, I know what hash I think you ought to have, you tell me what hash you have. And it, uh, the EC says, okay, I have a hash that looks like this. If they differ, then the AP says, well, that's not good enough here, I'm gonna give you a new image, you put that on there. And if they are the same, then it's fine if everybody boots and, and the EC continues on into read write, we're good. Um, there are a few other tricks. Um, one, for example, is let's suppose somebody has already hacked the EC. And so when the AP says, what's your hash? It just says, well, I'm gonna tell him what I had, but not what it is today because I've taken control. Um, well, the AP doesn't necessarily trust the result unless it can tell that the EC really truly is in its read only code. So we have a little one-way latch that's part of the motherboard. Um, and when you do a hard power reset, that latch is cleared. And at that point, the AP can read the value of, the, of that latch, but he can't drive it, and the EC can't drive it either. Um, and so in the read-only code, when the EC is leaving its read-only state, the last thing the read-only firmware does is it triggers that latch, and it says, okay, set, meaning I am leaving the read-only code, I'm now in my read-write code. So if someone comes along after that and replaces the read-write code or hacks in or does something wrong and now they have an exploit in there um, and the AP reboots and says, oh, are you running read-only? And he says, yes, I'm running read-only. The AP can actually look at that GPIO and look at the state of the latch and say, well, you know, somebody told me that you were running read-write code. Really? And then at that point, the AP can pull a reset signal that resets the whole board and including the latch. And now at this point, we're back to to safe. And this is all, of course, assuming that the read-only firmware has not been compromised, which, you know, for a remote attacker is pretty good. So we do some things like that. Um, and in recovery mode, everybody stays in read-only until we can verify. Um, but for things like removable power bricks, or in the case of the Pixel C, removable keyboards, um, we don't necessarily have this assertion that I know no one has tampered with the embedded controller because it's been somewhere else and I don't have that assurance that it's soldered to anything. Um, so for those systems, we use a full verified boot solution just like Randall described for the application processor where the embedded controller itself comes up, it has a read-only firmware, in there is a public key, it uses that public key to verify the read-write firmware that it should have or that it has. Um, and only if it's good does it jump to the read-write firmware. If it's not, it stays in a somewhat crippled mode where it doesn't really do anything useful. 
it's not a brick, but it won't charge fast. It won't charge you know, at high speed. It'll just say, okay, I'm a normal USB stupid adapter. You can get you know five volts at three amps, and that's it. Um, until you plug it back into a Chromebook or a Chrome that can talk to it and, and say, look, here's a signed image that you should update to. Um, there's no TPM on those bricks, so you know we use a different method for rollback, but it's still something that's protected, we think. Um, and no developer mode, of course, because why would you? Um, but all that really means to the end user is that it takes a second or two when you plug a power brick into the wall before it's ready to start providing power to you. Um, and that's not too bad for power brick uh, for security. Questions so far? I'm not going to make you wait to the end, so if you got some, just shout them out. Okay? All right. So, great. What does that mean to you? Well, if you want to play around with it, um, oh, I meant to bring that up here. We have two boards. Sorry about that. So, um, we actually have, uh, as part of the EC source code, which again, you can find under chromium.org, and I'll give you links to it um, after the talk if you want. Um, we've got two boards from ST Micro. Um, this is one of them. It's a little discovery board. It's got a, an ARM cord CPU on it, ST something or other. Um, and it's, it is supported by our operating system little Chrome OS EC. In fact, we use it as a test board just to prove that everything's working right. So if I plug it in, I get some little blinky lights and I can push the button and make them blink faster and so forth. Um, and so this is like 10 bucks. We also support a more advanced one called an eval board that has like a little LCD display and more pins and pinouts and, and some extra peripherals and things like that. Um, and they're a little more you know, 20 to 40, something like that. Um, but you can also make other boards work. So we have some examples there. Um, and to do it, you need a, a fairly recent version of GNU Make, or else the Make files complain, um, but you can fix them. Um, a fairly recent version of OpenOCD, and an ARM cross-compiler, and I just use the standard you know, Ubuntu Debian uh, cross-compiler. Um, so that's kind of fun, and, and this thing's actually got things like a, an accelerometer in there, and so you can wave it around and it'll tell, and you know, it's got some memory, it's got some, a whole bunch of jumpers and IOs. So this is not, an, a, not a bad little system to play with if you want something just to mess around with. It's pretty easy to set it up. Um, if you want to fiddle with the EC in your Chromebook, which you can and people do, um, then you want to be very careful. If you want to keep the Chromebook alive, um, my recommendation is that you use the right release branch, and there are two ways of finding that out. Uh, Chromebook itself can tell you, or you can download a recovery image for your Chromebook and take it apart. It's just a shell ball that you can untar with the, the right tools, which are fairly standard. And then there's a, a how-to of how to check out a branch and so forth. And that's important because it means that not all Chromebooks live in the top of trunk for the, the Chrome OS EC, or for that matter, Core Boot or anything else. Uh, when we get ready to ship a Chromebook uh, for manufacturing, um, we'll make a branch, and then once it ships, we tend not to support that in the continuing development path, but we have a, a permanent branch in which that's the version that we built. Uh, and so if you start with that version, you're guaranteed that it'll be the most compatible with anything that you, you build next. And of course, Flash ROM can be used to program the thing. Um, just be careful, right? Um, because as I mentioned, the, uh, the power rails and stuff are things that are controlled by the embedded controller. And so, you know, you've got to take the board apart, you've got to mess with it, remove some screws, and that will void your warranty. Um, I recommend that you disable the software sync because there's nothing more fun than burning a new image, putting it on there, booting the system, have it immediately replace the image you just wrote with a different one. Um, it take, uh, we've had a, a bunch of people who generally spend about three hours going, why don't my changes have any effect? And I'm like, did you disable the software sync? What is that? I'm like, uh, yeah, well, you're not making changes. You're just repeatedly flashing and erasing. Um, so, uh, you could also, after you've disabled software sync, you can update only the read-write half. That is, the software has a read-only half, read-write half. Well, if you disable software sync, it'll stay in read-only, and then you can tell it to jump to the read-write. And that way, you don't bother touching the other one. But really, you know, these are more fun because you can do stuff with them. And, you know, unless you're building a computer of your own from ground up or you just want to, 
Uh, there's not a whole lot of interesting stuff, I think, in there, um, except maybe the pixel light bar, but you can drive that from user space. I mean, there's a there's a document describing how that you can buy, or I can tell you. Um, and the thing is, of course, if you mess up the power sequencing, it may not boot, and it may not boot ever, because there are some things you could probably do to it will burn things out. So you just got to be careful. Um, but that's about it. Uh, so what are we doing? Well, the ongoing work is the work that we're always doing. Uh, continually, since day one, we've been doing this. More use cases, because again, we have a solution and to a problem, and so we end up using it for that. Um, we want to reduce the size. We want to simplify the code. We're always trying to get partners, meaning our external core boot manufacturers, the people who you know, brand and sell the core books, uh, the, the Chromebooks, get them more involved. And that's actually going very well. We have a number of people who are now contributing patches upstream. You've probably seen some in core boot. We've certainly seen some in, in the EC and kernel land. Um, and of course, we want to support more different boards and so forth. Maybe someday we want to do a major refactoring to just say, OK, here are all the things that we've gotten wrong or that we would like to do over. And there aren't that many because it's not that complicated. We would certainly welcome improved security. Um, there are many small uh, OSs for embedded systems now that are more secure. There are things like Little Kernel and, and you know various others that um, are probably more secure than this. Uh, as I mentioned, the way we came up with it was just we were in a rush and we did something quick that worked. Uh, we didn't take several weeks to evaluate all the alternatives because we didn't know we would need them until the last minute. Um, but those exist. It might be interesting to try some of those. Uh, and we, we're doing a little research on that if we can in the, in the time frame uh, of the next three to six months. Um, certainly within the EC firmware itself, um, there is no security. It's one flat address space. and. Uh, most SOCs don't have anything like, uh, you know, paging and stuff like that, but they do have some memory protections and certainly they have user supervisor mode. So the idea of having a embedded kernel that is more secure and then a less trusted set of uh, routines would be useful. And who knows what else, right? So, um, so that's about it. Um, far away. Yeah. Um, so you were saying too that there was a way to like change it from read only to read write? Firmware? Yes. So the same, the, the question is, there's a way to change it from read only to read write firmware. Um, yes. Yeah, so the same write protect, write protect switch that Randall mentioned, which is a screw on the motherboard that asserts or pulls down a pin on the spy flash itself uh, to prevent the spy flash registers from being changed. Um, that goes to the spy flash that is for the AP BIOS as well as the EC firmware. So the EC firmware itself has pins like that. Now, some of the EC, some of the implementations where the EC has the flash internal to it um, doesn't actually have that pin, but we treat it as one so that the, the read-only firmware and like the first hundred instructions says, what's the state of this GPIO? It says, oh, it says be read-only. And so we lock some internal registers that say, you can't touch this until I reboot. And so we try to emulate that sort of behavior. Um, and so to make that read-only part rewritable, uh, you actually have to take the case apart and remove the screw. No, I meant like the s software sync. Yes. Like loading our own, like only rewrite portion. Oh, oh, that part, right. So with software sync, the embedded controller is not doing any crypto calculations of its own, right? The software <laughs> sync is so that it doesn't have to because the, the crypto, you know, verifying a signature takes a long time. It's, it's a fairly time consuming process. And right now from cold power on, until the first kernel instruction runs is about 0.7 seconds. Um, and that's EC verification, handshake, AP verification, verify the kernel, verify all those firmware keys, kernel keys, kernel image, load it into RAM, boot. That takes about 0.7 seconds. And if we made the embedded controller do its handshake, it would act, actually add a second or two. And we don't want to wait around that long. Okay, because it's very important to us that Chromebooks ought to be just, you close the lid, you open the lid, it's ready to go. Um, so the software sync process is the EC comes up, he's in read only, the AP comes up, goes up, boots all the way up into his read write, and then asks the EC, are you running the hash I expected you to run? They compare the two hashes. If it's true, the EC can then boot into read write. And if you disable that, all that it means is they both come up, EC comes up in its read only code, the AP comes up and read write and just says, okay, I'm good. And it boot, it keeps on going. At that point, you 
log into the AP, can tell the EC, hey, go ahead and jump to read write. And it's like, okay, off it goes. And then you can come along and you can use Flash ROM and replace that read write image with a new one, right? And reboot and so forth. Oh, that's so I meant like, step. how would I log in? To, like, let's say I'm mm -hmm. I'm running the operating system right, right. now, right? And the EC on on this actually, it's yep. right now it's in read only EC yes. firmware. Mm -hmm. So how would I get it to like switch to read write? There is a command line tool that we we build called EC Tools, part of the source package. And that let, that's the tool by which users send commands back and forth between the AP and the EC. They communicate over different buses, depending on the board and the CPU, like it could be LPC, SPI, I squared C, um, but there is some communication. There's some communication channels there. So we have command line utilities to talk to the EC and to tell it things. In addition, the EC itself exports a console over serial port which may require a little soldering. It's just two pins, but you do you have to go in there and connect them, um, so that you can see what it's doing, so that you can talk to it. Uh, on this guy, um, it exports that serial port over USB, so you don't see it as it's booting. But once it's booted, you actually have a console that you can log into and type commands, and you're actually typing on this guy. Um, and so either of those methods, you can say jump to the other image, jump back, reboot, you know, show me registers, you know run this routine, do things, um, you can trigger those same things from the application processor as well. Does that help? Oh, but I mean like, because I've actually been, um, the EC tool, I've actually yep. been porting its code okay. to mm -hmm. Windows. So, oh, okay. Good. But okay. I noticed that there were some bugs in the uh, 8042 keyboard emulation. Oh, I'm sure there are. Yeah, that's quite possible. So, yeah. like right now what I've noticed is actually it, if you disable um, mm -hmm. scanning right. in the Windows and the open source React OS keyboard driver, yeah. it sends a different um, key scan enable. So unless I manually send in mm -hmm. the key scan enable, it yep. expects the keyboard's effectively dead. Yeah. Um, I would so, complain to Microsoft. I'm sure they'll jump right up and fix that. Oh, well, I actually ended up, <laughs> I actually ended up re writing my own keyboard driver okay. to get around that cool. so far. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I was hoping I could, like, Fix yeah. in read write EC for you, pro you. You probably could. If it, it, it sounds like it just needs another you know code that it needs to implement, and that's the sort of thing because we don't really care that much about Windows, or we don't expect it, or we've already set things up as far as we can. Um, yeah, that's the perfect sort of thing that you could go in there and fix. Uh, the only trick then is you know you got to stay in developer mode because as soon as you go back to normal mode, you know it goes away. But if it works and there's nothing wrong with it, we, we would consider it as a patch if it, there's some, you know, indication that it's necessary. So, okay. you know, like I said, we're, we're open source on all this. Randall's did the keyboard stuff, so you can yell at him. And the 8042 <laughs> thing is, is, you know, it's legacy and it's old and it's awkward and it's ugly. And we're trying to get yeah. away from that. <laughs> so, okay. Anything else? Uh, software sync. Yep. Does the EC do any verification on what the AP firmware is sending back to it, or is it just accept anything? That's it's given? pretty much accepting it at that point because the whole boot process, the EC is the one in charge of the power sequencing, mm -hmm. and so when it comes up in read only, it knows that the AP is off because it can look and say, "I've turned all the power off," right. so it's not running, and I know it's not running. And so then when it boots, it says, "Well, okay, now it's booted." And at this point, the next thing it does is just sit there and wait. It calculates the hash in case somebody wants it, and then it waits for further instructions. So until the AP comes up, runs through all its verification, and specifically tells the EC to jump to read write, it won't. Or to load a new. Yeah, or until it says, hey, load a new image. Okay, I'll load the new image. And that's currently implemented in depth charge? It's implemented somewhere. Okay. I think it might be depth charge. That makes sense, yeah. So, yes? Uh, so Instead of having uh, EC its own flash, could, would it be possible to wire it to SPI, to the, the same SPI that the BIOS uses, and yes. just have it fetch firmware from the SPI flash? Yes, and in fact, we've tried that and we've kind of looked at it. It's it's a bit awkward because we don't necessarily trust those, you know, the we don't trust each other, right? We have to say, but what you if... Just, you just said it blindly trusts the... Yeah, the, I mean, so let's say I... Okay, there it's it's Flash, it's read-only. So I fetch from it. How do, Well, one is how do I get at the address that the CPU, the EC's reset vector expects, right? So the EC's reset vector may say, I'm only going to fetch out a Flash address zero. Okay. Sure, you can introduce a simple uh, 
Right. We've got to have some, we got to have some converters in there. And then the other thing is, let's say I go to all the trouble of verifying that this has happened and I've put it in there and I've checked all my flash and then we hand over control to the AP and the AP boots from that same flash. Well, this is, you know, the AP he can go in there and erase it now. And that's the flash that I'm actually executing out of. I don't have enough memory to execute out of RAM. So I'm executing out of flash. So somebody who is on the AP side and has root or powers like root can go in and rewrite the, sp the flash that I am executing out of while I'm doing it, um, which would not be a great thing. So there's a bit of a trust issue there. you know. So we have thought about that. Randall can talk about it more because he's thought about it more. Um, but we've talked about it in terms of turning parts of the flash off and on. Did you have so, so the other really fun part about sharing the spy flash between the AP and the EC is the Intel management engine. Uh, <laughs> Because the management engine insists that the ME firmware and the uh, descriptor block be in read-write flash. So if your EC gets compromised, uh, so it's owned by somebody, the EC turns off the AP. So all of the normal protection that the Intel chipset has to lock up that spy bus to keep you from you know, mucking with the parts of it you're not supposed to from user land on the application processor go away. The EC then rewrites the boot descriptor to point to a different reset vector than the AP's read-only flash. The AP powers up the next time and it runs its read-write read flash thinking it's its read-only flash. And now I've owned your system from the first instruction out of reset on the AP and there's no way back from that. Right. So really one of, the, one of the key challenges we have there in, in sharing that spy flash is protecting the spy flash from the from a malicious EC coming in and mucking with it afterwards. We did actually look at a couple of Chromebooks at adding some latches so that we could give away the EC's ability to write to the spy flash after it had loaded its own code out of spy flash. That actually turns out that for the part cost of those muxes and uh, the discrete logic, it's actually cheaper just to put down a second spy flash and have the EC boot from its own spy and have the AP boot from its own spy. That's actually cheaper. And that's what we do on, you know, new Chromebooks that are coming out. So uh, are you saying the EC expects the EC with your um, unnamed operating system uh, ex <laughs> expects uh, to be able to write to a flash partition also? Or is well, it happy to just execute from read-only flash? It's, it's happy to execute from read-only, uh -huh. but if there were a bug in our EC code where the EC code itself could be compromised by somebody, that could then be used to escalate that compromise from a temporary compromise of the runtime EC code to a permanent compromise of the read-only AP BIOS. And that's really our concern with, with, with sharing there. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's the right time to continue this discussion. No, we'll, to we'll, we'll. Yeah, we can draw some pictures yeah, we, and stuff. We, so. we can get together at the next yeah. break, too, and, yeah. and find a whiteboard somewhere or drag one into the room. Yeah, and, and Joanna asked me, what does the ET, EC do, I mean, what does the ME do if we actually just mark its region as read-only? And I think the answer was it it didn't like us. It, it dies in strange and ill-defined ways. It Duncan shuts probably down knows the more. platform, yeah? Yeah, it, it mostly just kind of doesn't work well. I think they just don't assume that would ever happen, and so it just misbehaves. Um, all right, anything else? Cool. All right, and well, I've got some example stuff, and I will just say thank you. So, cool. All right.